So I do want to talk a bit about your your novel Blonde, since the new film version is coming out very soon. And I want to ask you briefly a few questions about it, because I'm um, personally I consider this one of the greatest novels of the past century. Uh, so, though. I'm e- very eager to watch the film. Um, I'm, and I'm sure it'll be fasc- a fascinating interpretation. Um, there are elements of this novel which I, I don't think can be translated into visual form because it is so rooted in language and the character's inner reality. And uh, so I'm eager to encourage people to to read the book as as well as seeing the the film. Um, so many people see the character of Marilyn Monroe and assume that that is also the identity of the actress. So what aspects of Norma Jean's interior life uh, did you want to evoke in this novel? Well, basically, the whole novel is really about Norma Jean Baker. And then she becomes Marilyn Monroe and then she becomes the blonde actress. So near the end of the novel, she's sort of... um, assimilated or suffocated inside this role, which is a performance, actually. I mean, there there is no Marilyn Monroe. It's a performance. It depends upon her bleach blonde hair being, you know, really very beautiful and and makeup and a mole and her eyebrows in a certain way. It's and, a character uh, type. Yeah. Yeah. And also she had the smile that was just a Marilyn Monroe luminosity that was very very wonderful so Norma Jean Baker was definitely able to project that for a while you know in certain circumstances maybe it's like an ice you're a gymnast like an Olympic gymnast you know there are things that, that you do at a certain age that you just seem to be able to do and the crowd just loves you and you win all these awards. Then you get a little older and though you're still the same person and and you just can't quite, you can't quite do it anymore, you know? Yeah. Probably I've been led to write about boxing for that same reason. Mm. It's like some magic suffused Norma Jean Baker for, for years of her life, she was able to project this wonderful persona then she starts losing it. And even as she's losing it, she's becoming ever more famous. And you could argue that Marilyn Monroe is more famous now than she was during her lifetime. When she was alive, she was belittled a good deal. She wasn't considered a good actress. She was considered a B-level actress. She didn't make nearly as much money as Elizabeth Taylor, or not to mention the male stars. The mm. men made it so much more on the whole than, than the women. Mm. But since she since she has died, she's kind of been singled out by posterity as a kind of iconic figure. But that actually wasn't the case when she was alive. Her movies could get very bad reviews. She could be um, insulted, like on talk shows. Uh, you know, just like she was like a joke, mm. almost like really like a joke. And I think when she met Laurence Olivier, I think she said to him, don't make me into a joke. That was her. She was anxious. She said they were in a movie together and he had kind of organized a movie. She said, don't make me into a joke. So you can sort of see how there's a kind of fascination with her, almost like a martyr or sacrificial figure. Mm. I was fascinated to see Norma Jean make herself into an actress she becomes an actress and then i watched all her movies that i could acquire and in her early movies she is this blonde person then in don't bother to knock with richard widmark it's pretty much a straight drama like it's a melodrama and she has a straight role she's not glamorous she's a plays a mentally unbalanced young woman And that's like a real, she's like just an actress. She could have been Olivia de Havilland or Betty Davis or any one of them, you know. Mm -hmm. She got picked up for Niagara and then she becomes this femme fatale. And there were billboards all over America showing Marilyn Monroe. And that was the beginning of the whole iconography of Marilyn Monroe. 
after that, she could never really have just a, a role in a movie. She couldn't be like, you know, Olivia de Havilland <laughs> would, would act in different movies and be like respected as an actress. From that point on, it was always Marilyn Monroe, no matter what she did. So in some in some like at hot, she's totally different from the way she was in Niagara. And she's totally different from the way she was in the Misfits. Yet somehow while she was living, it was all kind of lumped together. And I think that she suffocated under that. Um, just uh, a lack of any ability, maybe because she was a woman, to break through and ha and have respect. She was treated very disrespectfully by men in her life. It seems hard to believe that anyone would be so cruel to Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. but many men were. They actually, they were. Mm -hmm. Because she was very needy. And I think when a woman is extremely needy and dependent and cries easily or gets hysterical, I think even though she may be beautiful, many men just don't, they can't deal with that. Mm -hmm. I just miss her. And the the novel becomes increasingly hallucinatory as it progresses and Norma Jean's identity becomes blurred. Um, so what were the challenges and difficulties of, of writing such an intense narrative? You know, they were almost overwhelming. I remember two years I was working in the novel and though I would actually like to write another novel like that, I sort of feel like these uh, heavyweight boxers who retire because they can't take the training. <laughs> The training, it's the training. It's all those weeks of the training. They just can't do it anymore. Rocky Marciano said, you know, just can't do it. So I don't even know whether I could do it anymore. But every day I would work on this novel and it would seem that I was never making any headway. It was 1,400 pages eventually. And I remember I had heart palpitations. I remember going to, to talking to Ray, my husband, in the kitchen, I said, you know, I don't think I can, I don't think I can get through this. I just feel that I'm drowning. He mm -hmm. said, you'll be all right. So that's what husbands do. They say, that's okay. <laughs> really? Don't panic. And then once I remember, we went out with two friends We went out to see, to see the move to a movie. And I had brought all my, my notes around along with me because I was so anxious about what I was working on. Mm -hmm. We didn't have cell phones in those days. And I said, you know, I don't think I can see the movie. Why don't you go in? So I stayed in the car. These three people went in the movie. I stayed in the car and worked on the novel, like notes, you know, writing in longhand, mm. trying to figure something out. I remember how desperate I was. Then they came out of the movie and I said, oh, are you back so soon? Uh, wow. <laughs> the movie's over. And I said, yes, now we're going to dinner. You know, I thought, what if I had to live that way? all the time, you know, with this kind of, it's like a noose around my neck. So no, I don't, I don't mean to say that I didn't also love writing Yeah, mm -hmm. It's just that I was sort of, it was like a noose around my neck. And challenging. I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't go very far. I would always, always, always be thinking about the novel, the next chapter, the scene. Uh, everything was so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. My ordinary life, like my real life, was very minimal. It's a sort of like a really dazed, dazzling light is shining in your eyes right now. And though you know there's a room around you and there may even be some people talking to you, it's like this hypnotic, dazed, dazzling, blinding light is in your face and you're, you're entranced. Mm. So I finally got through with that and then I was able to cut back the novel by several hundred pages and some parts of it were published separately some parts of it were never published which is too bad because i always put as much i put as much into them as i put into anything else mm. and of course the norma jean was a historic individual uh but in your novel um her life and its tragic outcome also symbolize something much larger. So uh, what did you want to say in this book about America and our culture? Well, first of all, she is like a beggar maid. She, she comes up out of nowhere. She's sort of like an oki. She wasn't literally an oki, but she was from that kind of class. Sort of like, I, I think I compare her to a, a weed, a wild flower that pushes up. The concrete looks like it's all solid, but there's a little crack and some 
a hardy weed comes up. And there's so many people like that in American history who mm -hmm. make their way up from abject poverty, or they could be immigrants. Irving Berlin was another one. I think there were many, many children in this family. They were so poor in the slums of the Lower East Side of New York. He was just... He was just one of all these children. And somehow a few years later, he's Irving Berlin. Like mm -hmm. you, you can read about his life and you can't figure out how did he do that? Yeah, it's incredible uh, transformation. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand. You know, these people also didn't have educations. There wasn't any, there wasn't like a social welfare net that would help them go to school. And if Norma Jean had a mother who was schizophrenic, so she was just sort of lost. When her mother had her, her mother couldn't take care of her. Then her mother would put her in an orphanage or a foster home. Then her mother would take her out. Then her mother would put her back in. So she had such a broken childhood. As I said before, it wasn't even that she was an orphan because she couldn't be adopted. Like a normal family might have adopted her when she was four years old, but she wasn't an orphan. Her mother always, you know, her mother was there. So she had the worst of both worlds. But mm -hmm. the novel wants to, the novel wants to be a document, a posthumous document of her life. So she's looking at her life from all these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And there are different voices which she's imagining and, and listening to. It's like a really a uh, huge movie, a movie with different directors and different tones. Mm. And I've not seen the film yet, but um, uh, I know you said you you did see a version of it a long time ago. Um, but did, when you when you saw it, does the film bring out aspects of Norma Jean's story which you hadn't thought about before, or or did it make you think about um, her life in a different way from? from how you conceived it in the novel? Well, Andrew Dominic is a very brilliant director and he adapted a long novel, say the novel is about a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. He had adapted a really long novel to make a film that's about two hours or so. So he chose a trajectory of Norma Jean's life and he follows that through line. It's very, it's, it's very organized and very uh, unified. Whereas my novel has things about uh, the McCarthy hearings and Arthur Miller and Joe DiMaggio and going to Korea. And my novel is sort of all over the place because it's taking in a large territory. Whereas Andrew Dominic is making a movie. So you have one character. First, she's played by a child actress. Then she's played by Arna, Arna de Amas. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of with that character, you know, like all the way through. And you're not going to learn much about pop culture or Joseph McCarthy or communism or, you know, the things that make up a, an epic novel, uh, history and backgrounds of characters and so forth, the, the backstories. You're not going to find that in a movie because a movie just moves. Mm -hmm. I mean, movies, you know, that the name of movies is just moving right along. So I found it very gripping, emotionally draining, because the brilliant actress who plays Marilyn Monroe is totally, she's totally Marilyn Monroe. Mm. And she's taken in by this vulnerability and anxiety to be, to be Marilyn, like to look in the mirror and not quite see. It's not quite right. So the makeup man, Whitey, that was his name, actually. Mm. I think that was really his name in, in my mm. novel, too. Uh, he has to keep working on her till they get that face in the mirror. And she can't leave the dressing room until they get that. Mm. Now, Marilyn Monroe herself was always late for everything. Mm -hmm. She could be seven hours late. I knew people who knew Arthur Miller when he was married to her. They had invited them to dinner in the summer in like on the Cape or somewhere, or maybe it was Provincetown. And literally, Arthur Miller and Marilyn Monroe never once got to their house. Like they were invited to dinner many, many times and they were always going to come. 
But when it came down to it, Marilyn Monroe just, she just couldn't leave, you know. Mm -hmm. I imagine her getting dressed up and changing her clothes and looking in the mirror because she knew that as soon as she stepped out of her privacy, everybody was going to be looking at her, staring at her, taking pictures of her and talking about her. And they would say things like, oh, she's not so pretty. Oh, she's kind of fat. You know, all these horrible things that people hear. A Meryl Streep hears things like that. <laughs> you know, oh, well, she's not really very pretty. You hear that a lot, I think, if you're somebody like Marilyn Monroe. So mm -hmm. this anxiety about appearing in public was based on something very real. Yeah, this absolute self-consciousness of overwhelming that's so overwhelming yeah. people make up stories even about writers like i'm not i'm of no interest at all but there are stories about me like i have seven typewriters or seven word i mean the the ludicrous stories people make up yeah. <laughs> uh, you know they and i'm just a writer and there's nothing glamorous about being a writer but <laughs> people will make up bizarre stories yeah. and especially about celebrities who feel vulnerable mm. yes i guess people fantasize on sort of yeah public figures that they feel like they have some connection to when obviously they, they, they don't um, but yes just, but also they make up things about them yeah in fact you'll find, things, you'll find things in biographies that are just not true mm. i mean even in my biography which is actually quite a wonderful biography by Greg Johnson. Yes. Nonetheless, people told him things that were not true. Mm. Now, he didn't know that. And I would correct him once in a while, but I thought, you know, that's just not right to be correcting people. It's just something about people, if they don't really remember, they make something up. Mm. I don't mm. want to say I don't remember. Oh, Joyce had seven typewriters. <laughs> Please don't. No, Joyce had like one... I would have one typewriter and then I get a new one and have like two typewriters and I have a word processor. I never had any more than that. You know, like one thing that you're working on and maybe an older model somewhere in the house and mm. all that. It's so exaggerated. Mm. I read so, a um, funny article recently about uh, the personal library of Marlena Dietrich and how um, when uh, people went to look at all of her books um, after um, she had died and, and how she had a number of biographies about herself. And she oh, went through okay. these biographies and wrote in the margins saying, no, this isn't true. This isn't true. I <laughs> oh, I know. Even very recently, people who I, uh, were interviewing me, and then they wrote something and they would just get something wrong. But it wasn't anything malicious or important. It's just not right. And you feel, well, it's not worth trying to correct it. Even I remember people would spell my name wrong. Uh, I wouldn't even correct that. It's just, it's it's out of control. Yeah, We can't control. Really we just much. can't control. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you finally, you've described what an enormous and overwhelming undertaking it was for writing Blonde and, and how you feel like maybe now you, you couldn't do that again. So um even though you are an incredibly skilled and accomplished writer, um, are do you have any? Do you get any ideas or plans for novels sometimes, which you you just feel like, oh, that is simply too challenging for me to to write now? Um, yeah, do you, do you have any ideas or, or sort of plans like that? Well, I have to have a I have to have a challenge that I see that seems worthwhile. Mm. You know, when I was writing certain novels, well, like Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars, which is quite long. Mm. Um, I'm living in a house where the, the novel sort of takes place. There are, there are things about that long novel, Night, Sleep, Death, and the Stars, that though it was a long, ambitious, and difficult novel, I knew that I could do because it's sort of set right in this lo locality and there are things in it that grounded me. With Marilyn Monroe, I had to really go out of my safe space or comfort zone into uh, the world of the epic where I'm looking at history and looking at different personalities. Now, if I, it's like M Melville writing Moby Dick, he learned a lot about whales and it's a compendium of all sorts of knowledge, uh, like an encyclopedia of many things of the, of the 19th century having to do with whales. So Melville learned all that, but he didn't necessarily know that. 
Now, he was about 34 when he wrote Moby Dick. If he had lived longer, if he were 75 or 80, could Melville write Moby Dick? You know, it's a question, mm. maybe or maybe not. You know, Muhammad Ali was boxing long before he should have just stopped and retired because that which he had once been able to do very easily, he couldn't do without a lot of effort. So, mm. um, but as I say, it depends on what the novel is. Is it worth it? Because if it's worth the challenge, then definitely one would get up in the morning eagerly. But sometimes if you don't have that uh, sort of a large epic, you could you could write something smaller that's that, that's very truthful and has its own integrity, but it's a smaller scale. Mm-hmm. And I think we can all do that. Well, thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, Always nice to talk to you, Eric. Lovely to see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.